thank you, Steve, for the introduction, and uh, really thank you to the Space Foundation for organizing this symposium, despite COVID and despite all the hardship which we're all facing. And I have really to say, fantastic job. Thank you from also from our side, from the European Space Agency, for organizing this event. Uh, you've done a fantastic job. We really enjoy all the presentations, all the meetings, all the facilities, and uh, really uh, my big thanks uh, to you and your teams uh, for the very good work. So let me update you on ESA, what ESA is doing, European Space Agency, uh, what we are doing today, what are some of the highlights, but also a small look into the future. European Space Agency, I'm sure you're very familiar with uh, ESA itself, just on one sheet, a few numbers of uh, how we are and what we are. And uh, if you put ESA in context uh, to the other space agencies worldwide, we are not the biggest one, we are not the smallest one, we are of a reasonable size. But I think I can really say, and uh, this is something I'm very proud of, that we have a, a very dedicated, excellent workforce, a lot of very skilled people doing a tremendous job in producing satellites, science uh, that is quite outstanding uh, and really among the top of the world, despite maybe not being one of the largest space agencies. But talking of the largest, which is NASA, I really would like to acknowledge uh, the speech of uh, Bill Nelson this morning, a fantastic speech, very inspiring, and I'm very proud as ESA to be a partner of this agency who is doing so many wonderful things and uh, so many wonderful projects. And uh, I can only say that we are very committed on our side, on ESA, to work with NASA, but also many other partners in making space happen and being, bringing space forward. So you see we are um, an agency, an intergovernmental agency. We have 22 member states. I should uh, make it clear for those who are not so familiar with the European context that we are not part of the European Union. We are an intergovernmental agency with our own member states, which are largely overlapping, but not exactly the same. For example, the UK after the UK left the European Union is still a member of ESA, and also Switzerland and Norway are members of ESA, but not members of the uh, European Union. Our budget is about six and a half billion. Uh, it is moderate, but uh, certainly we try to do the best uh, with the money we can in order to produce uh, very important uh, missions uh, and, uh, and results. What I put on this slide here is some of the upcoming milestones. There's much more going on and many more launches and many more activities than you see on this chart, but just to highlight some of them. But I also took care to put the flags there with the partners with whom we work together. And this is something that I'm very proud of as ESA, that we have a very international partnership or collaboration with many partners around the world, of course here in America with NASA, but also NOAA, USGS and other organizations, but also in other parts of the world. And you see some of these uh, missions, some of these logos on this slide here that we work uh, with uh, UMITSAT, with Roscosmos, with JAXA, the European Commission obviously uh, in Europe, uh, but uh, really basically with uh, all the uh, major space agencies uh, worldwide. So some of the highlights that are coming in the ESA context are, and you have heard it this morning from uh, Bill, is the launch of the James Webb Space Tele Telescope at the end of this year. And we as ESA, we're very proud to be part of this project. It's clearly led by NASA, obviously, but we have also some very important instruments on board. But also, I'm very happy and very proud and very committed that we can launch this fantastic uh, space telescope with a rocket from Europe, Ariane 5, from French Guiana at the end of this year. We will take good care. It's a very important mission. It's probably the most important launch this year. Uh, and we will take all the precautions on our side to make sure that this is going flawlessly. But also you see other milestones and missions that are coming up. Uh, certainly, uh, we are participating very significantly on Artemis 1 with the European Service Module. Uh, we have next year the maiden launches of Vega C and uh, Ariane 6, which are the successor rockets of Vega and Ariane 5 today. Uh, so they will next year have their maiden flight and obviously then operate for a couple of years. We are in the midst of an astronaut selection, uh, which is expected to conclude uh, by the end of next year. Uh, MTG, uh, which is the Meteosat third generation satellite, which we do uh, with UMITSAT or for UMITSAT, but uh, as part of an interna international network uh, with NOAA in particular in the US. Uh, we, we are launching next uh, year, at the end of next year, one very big satellite and very advanced, uh, and certainly a highlight also from our point of view. HERA, 
uh, Galileo second generation coming up uh, in uh, 2024, Pepe Colombo arriving at Mercury at 2025, where we are working together with JAXA uh, in uh, making this mission uh, possible. Now, some of these examples which I've shown you and some of the uh, more details of, uh, of these missions. I don't need to explain this picture here, James Webb. You know it extremely well. And as I said before, uh, this is really, this will change uh, astrophysics and uh, the science uh, for years, if not decades to come, because the new information we will get, we have heard it this morning, allows us to go back close to the Big Bang, 200 million years away from the Big Bang, which is enormously impressive, and to understand better our origins, uh, the universe's origin, uh, with uh, the measurements and the images coming from this one. And as mentioned, the launch is at the end of this year on Ariane 5 from French Guiana. Pepe Colombo flyby on its way to Mercury, uh, which is a very important mission which we launched uh, just recently together with JAXA, uh, with, uh, which is very, with a lot of instruments on board. Now it, it's doing a flyby uh, on our planet, but the end destination is uh, Mercury to really explore this planet, which is not so well understood, and there have been a few missions, but many, many years ago, and certainly Pepe Colombo will reveal some of the secrets of the inner uh, planets of uh, our solar system. Another example is shown here, Choose. We're launching it next year, going to the other end of the solar system, uh, to the uh, larger planets, uh, the colder planets, uh, here Jupiter, but also the moons of Jupiter, for example, Europa, uh, Ganymede, which we are also uh, assessing and uh, monitoring with uh, the satellite, uh, which will be quite interesting because there are some people who believe that under the ice covers of uh, some of the icy moons, it would be worth going there and really seeing what, whether anything is there except water, uh, and uh, if so, whether possibly microbial life could be uh, discovered at some point of time. Choose is not doing that, he's not having a lander, he's, uh, assessing, uh, the, uh, he's assessing Jupiter and the moons, but it might provide extremely important information for future missions also to better understand uh, this uh, planet of our solar system. ExoMars, very important mission, of course, I don't need to talk about uh, land uh, rover, uh, not land, but uh, Mars rovers uh, here in the States. Uh, we all enjoy the news of uh, Perseverance almost every day, fantastic uh, achievement. Also in Europe, we are planning the mission uh, next year. It will launch next year. Uh, this is a joint project we are doing together with Roscosmos, uh, and we are in the final phases of uh, of uh, putting the satellite together, the testing, and eventually launching it in September uh, next year. And again, this will be quite complementary to other measurements that are being taken right now on uh, Mars uh, to further understand the planet uh, with uh, quite a significant instrumentation on board and many partners uh, involved. Space transportation launches. Uh, we have uh, two launches, as I mentioned before, the Ariane 5 and the Vega launcher today, the next generations are being uh, prepared for the maiden launch, but also once we have the maiden flights uh, successfully conducted, of course we need to launch into an exploitation program and already think what's happening afterwards, so what happens after Ariane 6, what happens after uh, Vega C uh, to prepare future technologies and really make sure that uh, we have our launch capability for our own satellites, but also for other satellites of other nations. As you certainly know, Ariane Spass uh, uh, has been and is uh, quite successful of launching uh, other uh, nations' uh, satellites of, uh, of all kinds into various orbits. You also see here Space Rider, uh, which is a project which uh, also is conducted, uh, uh, starting uh, or is already undergoing, but uh, is certainly a very interesting project uh, which will give us experience towards uh, uh, um, having a presence in space, uh, possibly eventually leading to a human presence. And this here shows the human presence, and here I really have to acknowledge the partners of the International Space Station, NASA, but also Roscosmos, the Canadian Space Agency, um, and uh, JAXA. And you see here our two astronauts, uh, Thomas Pesquet and Matthias Maurer on the left side. Uh, Thomas Pesquet is in orbit right now. He will uh, take the commandership of the space station at the end of uh, his term, which will be in October. And he will then be met uh, by Matthias Maurer uh, in early November, uh, who will then be the next ESA astronaut. And then following after him will be 
Samantha Cristoforetti, you see her on the right hand side, uh, who will then follow Matthias Maurer. So we will have three astronauts uh, from ESA in a row, which is actually quite unusual. We've never had this in our uh, history. And this also shows our strong interest in the exploitation of the space station, in using the space station as an asset uh, for the experiments we are doing. Uh, and this is uh, really an enormous asset for us in Europe to work here with all the partners of the space station on the various activities. Talking of astronauts, uh, we launched a call for the next generation of astronauts in uh, Europe uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, we had uh, a deadline of the applications coming in in March, and uh, we were almost falling off the chair when we saw the numbers of applications coming in. Uh, just to recall, in 2009, we had the last call for astronauts, so many years ago, and there we got about 8,000 applications. Now, we got 22,500 applications, so a multiple of uh, what we got uh, 10 years ago. Uh, but it also shows that space is cool. The young generation wants to go to space, is interested, and is really something where Europe uh, is uh, investing uh, in order to make sure that also from the astronaut side, which of course is a very strong aspect of uh, public relations, of communication, in addition to the experimental work which is done on the space station, is a very attractive thing to do. We are right now going through the se selection of uh, the astronauts. Uh, we expect uh, to down-select them uh, by the end of next year, uh, and uh, we have so many more uh, applications than expected, so we have to really see how we manage that. Originally, we planned to do it by September. It may now be a couple of uh, weeks longer because simply we have to really pay attention to all the applications which we get to make sure that we are really finding the best candidates uh, uh, for the next flights. We have put a lot of emphasis on female applications. Uh, we have about one quarter of the applicants uh, being female. And there's a, another novelty in this call. We have a so-called para-astronaut, uh, which is uh, a call for candidates with a physical handicap, and we would like to bring them also into space. Uh, of course, we need to, in this case, do a feasibility study to see what the handicap uh, would mean in space, uh, whether uh, adaptations are needed on the space station, on the rocket, and the capsules, or otherwise. Of course, there are only certain handicaps that can be accepted. They're physical handicaps, of course, not mentally. Uh, and uh, this is uh, an, a novelty. It doesn't exist yet in the world. And I uh, really would like to underline that uh, this is a message from ESA that space is there for everyone. And we really want to make sure that space is uh, an opportunity, not only for fighter pilots, but really also more normal people. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have, of course, seen the, uh, the recent space tourism flights with uh, a very wide spectrum of uh, people going to space, but certainly also for scientific experimentation and uh, technical work on the space station, we would like to offer this opportunity to people with uh, physical handicaps. Galileo, our navigation system, uh, we are right now uh, finishing the completion of the first generation of uh, Galileo, uh, which uh, we have a launch coming up uh, at the end of this year. But in parallel, we already work on the second generation, the next generation of uh, satellite, much more complex, uh, much more uh, powerful, sophisticated compared to the first generation, and certainly they will yet again set the standard uh, in terms of accuracy uh, of the the navigation signals are being derived. Of course, Paul Verhoff, uh, the director for, uh, for the navigation uh, uh, program in ESA, is in very close contact with uh, the colleagues here in the US uh, on the, of the Air Force and other colleagues. And there, I can really assure you that we are working extremely well together. But we are carrying out this uh, program as ESA for the European Commission or on behalf of the European Union, who is providing the majority of the funding. But ESA is doing. I would say the majority of the technical work, the development of the satellite, and uh, all the related uh, activities uh, going with it. Another case where we're quite active is uh, space debris, uh, space debris removal in this case. And you see uh, a satellite that is being built uh, in, through a new approach of procurement. So we buy a service. We have offered to companies to bid for removing an object from space. In this particular case, what you see here in this animation, it's an upper stage of a Vega rocket. And uh, we have asked them to give us proposals how they want to do it and what they want to remove. We have given them some candidates or some objects to remove. They have given us proposals, and this is built now in what you would call in a complete new space approach uh, where they provide this service. But the other novelty, obviously, is that this is something that is a, a new undertaking uh, where we certainly, uh, within Europe, the first time 
taking an object out of space uh, in order to liberate some of the crowded space there. Of course, you may say there are thousands and thousands of satellites there. How much does it help if one satellite is taken out of this uh, uh, big uh, crowd? But uh, certainly, this is uh, an important step in order to to test the technology and to specifically go for those satellites where, which are creating more obstacles and more problems in terms of, uh, uh, other, of uh, the orbits for other satellites. Clear Space One, uh, it will be launched in 2025, so we are now in the development phase, and I'm really excited uh, about this initiative, which of course supplements many other space safety activities which we're doing, but this is a quite a unique uh, uh, operation we are doing here. Then let's go back and look a bit more horizontally in some of the technology developments we're doing. You see here artificial intelligence and quantum. Of course, uh, this is done very widely now. But I'm very proud to show the upper left uh, picture here, which is um, FISAT-1. And FISAT-1 is uh, actually two uh, CubeSats, which we launched uh, already some years ago, 2017. It was the first time that we took a commercial AI chip which we ordered in, which you can order in Amazon, for example. Of course, we tested it in space for uh, radiation uh, and other uh, effects in space. And we, may, we used this AI chip, uh, which cost $70 on, uh, on Amazon, if, uh, if you want to buy it. Uh, we, we tested it, and we trained uh, the chip to detect clouds from cloud-free areas. Uh, based on training samples. We put this chip on the CubeSat, we flew it together with uh, an imaging uh, sensor. The satellites had also some other sensors on board, but the imaging sensor was linked with the AI chip. And the AI chip in space distinguished clouded from cloud-free areas and only sent images or data down from the cloud-free areas because the clouded ones we were not interested. Uh, of course, this is a simple application because it shows the principle, but it also shows the power of edge computing uh, in space of AI. I know that today there are several other companies doing the same, uh, but we have been certainly the first ones uh, in ESA through this FISAT uh, satellite to have such an AI chip on board an Earth observation satellite applying machine learning uh, for applications of uh, artificial intelligence in space. And of course, on ground, this is much wider utilized. We are having projects to build digital twins of the Earth and the universe to really simulate our planet and to make what-if scenario calculations and models uh, in order to understand what happens if this parameter changes, what happens if that parameter changes. And of course, in the context of climate change, crucial, because you do want to simulate what happens if I change, uh, for example, the the gasoline uh, cars into electric cars, if I change uh, cow, uh, coal power plants into other ones, or if I change one agricultural production into another one, what's the impact on the environment, on people, not only on the, uh, on the carbon emissions, but what does it mean for people, society, economy, and really having a holistic uh, approach uh, of uh, this simulation of our planet as a digital twin. So we are building up a quite significant project uh, now uh, and uh, with the European Commission, and this is certainly very interesting. The same we also uh, will do for the universe uh, uh, in a more generic sense. Also quantum gravimetry, a new discipline, not flying yet and not existing. Uh, something very exciting because it uh, has enormous precision of uh, mass changes on our planet uh, with multiple applications, uh, commercial, security, uh, also climate related. Um, and this is something where we want to engage. Uh, but we are at the early stages of doing it. Obviously, quantum computing will be needed to process huge volumes of data. Just to remind you that uh, through the Copernicus program, which Steve mentioned earlier, we are producing the largest volumes of uh, data in Earth observation. 300 terabytes of data every day are released uh, to the public free of charge to everyone, uh, free and open data policy. And certainly, uh, with these huge data volumes, uh, processing and analysis are key uh, aspects to consider. Quantum, uh, another application of quantum is obviously quantum communication. And here, quantum key distribution is uh, uh, something where we are working actually quite uh, a lot these days, uh, also together with the European Commission to build up uh, the building blocks of, uh, of, a, constell of a secure uh, connectivity constellation uh, in Europe. Uh, we are building or developing one satellite uh, called Eagle One, uh, which will be launched uh, in two years uh, to test uh, this quantum key distribution technology uh, in space. Other applications, you see here um, the example of Copernicus. Uh, this is NO2 
concentrations uh, in the years 2019, 20 and 21 in the months of March and April. Uh, and as you remember, March, April last year in 2020 was a lockdown due to COVID. And you see clearly that in 2020, the, the color is uh, not as red uh, and the concentrations of NO2 or pollution uh, has gone down by about 50%. Of course, you have all seen that. You have all breathed uh, much cleaner air, uh, but uh, this is uh, what we are monitoring regularly from space. In fact, here using our Copernicus Earth Observing System, which is uh, quite uh, an advanced uh, system uh, to monitor the state and the health of our planet, we have decided together with JAXA and together with NASA to establish a dashboard. Uh, and this dashboard brings applications of what is the impact of COVID and what we can see from space on the uh, impact of COVID on the economy, on agriculture, on the number of cars parked on parking lots, on uh, water quality, on air quality, and so on. And this is quite an interesting dashboard. I really invite you to uh, look for it. I don't have the URL in my head, but if you type uh, dashboard uh, COVID-19 and ESA or COVID-19 NASA and JAXA, you will come to it and it's uh, quite impressive. There are many parameters now where we have time series uh, to see the impact of COVID during the lockdown, how some of these parameters changed. And talking of climate, uh, we have uh, heard also this morning from Bill, very, uh, Bill Nelson very impressively that climate is a top priority also for NASA, uh, of course linked to the national agendas of President Biden, but also in Europe we have a very strong climate uh, agenda uh, with the European Union Green Deal, but also many other countries in Japan, uh, in China, in India, uh, climate change has become uh, the reality and the problem to tackle after COVID, and space can do a lot there. Uh, in fact, uh, what you see here is the IPCC report, which was just published very recently, and out of 50 essential climate variables, half of them can be either only or best monitored from space. Uh, parameters like ice coverage, melting of the Arctic, melting of the Greenland ice, sea level temperature uh, rises, uh, sea level height rises, uh, uh, changes in uh, air quality, uh, increase of uh, carbon dioxide, and so on. And these parameters, of course, you need to monitor globally, and their satellites are the best means of doing so. And there, I'm very proud to say that we have a very strong cooperation with uh, key partners in order to really tackle the issue of climate head on because, as you see, there is no other planet, uh, certainly not for maybe 100 or 200 or several hundred years on which we can really live, not only a few people, but really live. And therefore, we have to make sure that we understand what's going on in order to make right policy decisions. By the way, this also will go into the, will feed into the digital twin Earth uh, setup I mentioned earlier, because you do need the observations in order to simulate and therefore prepare uh, in, uh, decisions for uh, decision makers. I don't need to explain this picture here. I feel very sorry for the damage that has uh, been caused by all these disasters, but clearly linked uh, to drastic changes of our environment in the US, but also in many other countries. In Europe, we are suffering a lot also from fires and uh, uh, droughts. Uh, uh, from uh, storms, uh, from flooding. It's really quite uh, um, uh, amazing or quite impressive how many uh, changes and how fast these changes are coming. And certainly, again, this brings me to the need to well understand what happens on this planet. And what you see here in this picture is the next generation Copernicus 2.0 with the next set of satellites which we are developing right now uh, in Europe with the European Commission, but also with international partners in order to tackle and measure some of these critical parameters which you see on this screen here. And this brings me towards the end of my talk. Uh, just two slides on Agenda 2025. Um, and this is probably not known to people outside uh, Europe, but uh, the Agenda 2025 is a document which I put on the table on my first day as the GEO visa. Uh, you mentioned that I started this year in March, on the 1st of March. And on the 1st of March, this document was put there as a vision of what I would like to do with ESA, with space in Europe, in order for the next couple of years. And of course, in space, if you define the future the next couple of years, you need to look into the next decade, because space programs are uh, having a long-term implementation scale. So what are the challenges for the next decade? And then deriving from there, uh, what needs to be done immediately to start working on them and to, uh, to really tackle these issues? 
It's a very light document of only 17 pages. I really recommend you to have a look through. It's actually quite funny the way it's written because it starts with a story in the year 2035 uh, uh, with uh, two young uh, uh, researchers talking to each other, one an astronaut and one working on ground, what, imagining what the world looks like in 2035. But of course, this leads then into the priorities uh, which we have outlined uh, uh, for space in Europe. And I really say space in Europe because this document has been reflected and elaborated with my member states. Uh, and uh, with my staff in-house, with the European Commission, with industry, the key stakeholders, to make sure that this is really an agenda for Europe in space uh, in order to really bring your Europe forward in space. So what is the key message? What you see here are certainly the immediate priorities, but the key message is that Europe has a lot of excellence in space. We have a lot of very good engineers, satellite projects, uh, scientists, uh, uh, government institutions working, uh, spa working with space and using space, and this is great. However, the means are not always enough in order to allow those people to unfold and really bring all this uh, excellence uh, to work and uh, to flourish. And there, I really believe that ESA or Europe needs to look deeper into what can space bring to society, and we take the good example of some other nations where the importance of space is fully recognized by politics at top level. I take, of course, uh, the US as a prime example, but also other countries have uh, exactly the same approach, where at top level, at president's level, decisions are made. This is what we want to do in space, and this is where we go. In Europe, I have to say, we are a bit more complicated. We have many countries to deal with, but also space is not at the level of head of state or head of government. It is normally or typically one level below at the level of ministers where the bigger decisions are made. And I really think that space is so important for economic reasons, for strategic reasons, for political reasons, for environmental reasons, for many reasons. It's so important that we have to bring this to the attention of heads of state, heads of government. And that's why I'm proposing to organize a space summit next year in spring together with the European Commission and obviously our member states and to really have this debate at level of ministers and top, uh, top uh, decision makers. Uh, last uh, month, we had a, a meeting with uh, uh, the French presidency. Fran France is holding the presidency uh, of uh, ESA at the moment, or co-presidency, uh, and uh, holds the EU presidency in the first semester of next year. So France is uh, uniquely placed to host this summit, and uh, we are working uh, with uh, the French partners that uh, President Macron will invite and will host such a summit to really debate what Europe wants. And I really want to debate content, what are the domains where we need to invest. And I don't want to preempt some of this discussion. We're in the midst of preparation uh, work uh, in Europe to define what these priorities are. But certainly I would like to propose flagship programs which last more than 10 years, cost more than 10 billion uh, each in order to really engage in uh, some of these activities. And you can obviously imagine what uh, this might be because uh, they are, some of them are obvious where we really expect that uh, space will, can make a step forward and really become an integral, essential part of the political agenda, but also for the benefit of uh, society and people in Europe. And with this, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.